Uh, my name is Dylan Goss. I'm the writer of Mara. You can find us on the web at mara-comic.com. If you like what we do, support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash stuffrock. And you are on Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we're interviewing the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic writer and a writer in general as well, too. Just saw his comic today. I've read through issue one, or uh, I should say chapter one. I've, I've gone through what is available for chapter two. So it's a bit of a tease that there isn't more yet, but... It has piqued my interest, and we are joined today by the ever-talented Dylan Goss. How are you doing today, Dylan? Pretty good. Thanks for having me, Kurt. And I forgot to mention, of course, the comic is called Mara, but for those that don't know what Mara is about, please tell us. Mara is about a young girl in a small fishing village who is basically thrust into adventure. You know, she's not the chosen one. She's not born with magical powers or anything like that. She just happened to receive them effectively out of luck. And you can call it good or bad luck because things aren't looking too hot for her, but she'll manage. So then what spurred you to create this particular comic? Well, I was inspired pretty heavily by... Daphne Keene's performance in Logan. Yeah, that, that first fight scene in particular where she is portrayed as effectively an animal first and then a person, that really spoke to me. At the time, I was, I was in the theater watching that, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it yet, but it was there. It was stuck in my head. What did you draw from to create your character of Mara? Because you have a beautiful world, you have a beautiful art style, a great writing, you know, it, it's... It flows very smoothly, and, I, and I'm loving what I'm seeing so far. But but to create these characters in this world, what did you draw from to create these these characters? Uh, the world itself is based in part on the Dungeons and Dragons setting of Dark Sun. Dark Sun is also a, a bit of a desert world with a metal scarcity. So there's some inspiration there. Uh, I would say it's not quite as terrible as the world of Dark Sun, having having played there, but it's it's not great. Also, the tribe has real world influences from both the Viking and Inuit peoples. What what about those cultures? Kind of speaks to you then. What I wanted to portray is that her people used to be a winter tribe, and of course, you've read chapter one, you know that they're not. In what happened was there was a war between the gods a long time ago, long before anybody on screen was born. They set the sky on fire. The day-night cycle is completely destroyed. What used to be an ice fishing village became the only place around with a river. So this was an ecological disaster on an enormous scale. And uh, of course, a lot of people in warmer climates at the time didn't survive. And those that did survive had to adapt and make huge changes to their lifestyles. So that's what interested me there. I wanted to explore how these cultures would evolve if subjected to something so far out of left field for them. You know, working together with an artist in a collaborative effort is always an interesting experience. You know, as a, as a writer yourself, you're, you don't know the vision of your characters specifically, or you may have subtle influences, like I said, with the, with the, with the dark sun mythos and all of that stuff in, in D and D. How did you find your artist and, and what did you enjoy about their particular art style that, that helped you? I'm a software developer as my day job. So of course I've worked with designers before and there's one designer I've worked with an awful lot. She also does comics. So I asked her first, would you like to be a part of this? Would you like to be the artist on this? But she only does sci-fi. She put out, uh, put out an ad for me with her friends from the art school she went to. And by the end of the day, I had 15 
artists in my uh, in my inbox. And none of them were bad. You know, they were all pretty good. Some of them presented themselves better than others. It's hard to judge an artist who doesn't have a portfolio set up, right? Mm -hmm. I ended up shortlisting three. I paid each of them provide me with a concept art of Mara. And I didn't specify exactly what she looked like. I never said, this this is her hair length. This is her skin tone. Uh, I just described the world and her tribe, of course, let them ask me questions, but I wanted to see where they would go with it. They went very different directions with it. One of them leaned more heavily into the Viking culture. One of them gave me something else entirely, and it was good. It wasn't what I was looking for, but it was good. And then I saw Rosie's work. Sometimes you see something and you just know that's exactly what you want. That's, that's what happened there. When she submitted hers, I was still waiting on one of the artists. I started thinking, how long do I really want to wait for this artist? Of course, it didn't take very long. I was just getting impatient because I already saw what I wanted. They were all good. I just had to pick one. She has a very East meets West style. You know, it is clearly manga influenced and it also has Western influence. I thought that was probably most appropriate here because that describes my influences as well. Now that you found your artist, though, as a writer yourself and, and dealing with, with artists uh, as a software developer, you, you understand that give and take aspect when it comes to creativity. You know, what about communicating with Rosie, what exactly you wanted once you found found her as your artist? Was it, was it an easy collaboration back and forth? Was there a lot of uh, conversations and, and flexibility in terms of how you wanted the world to be created? Or was this more of a, here's D&D Dark Sun, you know, let's kind of do what we can with it, but make it, you know, brighter as we have here? Well, uh, she definitely has a lot of creative freedom. And uh, I, th- I think that's a plus, definitely, um, because she's also uh, very interested in storytelling. So uh, allowing her to have some freedom in that regard uh, has definitely made the comic better. As far as how, uh, how strict I am with the script, I'm very not strict with the script. I don't define the uh, specific panels on every single page. For instance, uh, the Marvel method is your standard for comic scripts, but that requires the writer to specify every single panel and the contents of every single panel. That works for big companies like Marvel, where the gears have to be moving pretty rapidly all the time. Artists aren't just drawing robots. They want to, they they have their own creativity as well. They want to express that creativity. Telling them what every single frame looks like, I think steps on that creativity. And it's not to say that I give no direction at all. I have to, or else I wouldn't be writing, to specify every single background character's facial expression and what they're wearing, I think is a little bit much. Is this your first comic book you've ever written or first story regarding comics? This is my first uh, comic ever written. I've done a lot of writing since I've been able to write. I've been writing fantasy, writing about dragons and uh, adventurers. I struggled for a while to find how I wanted to do this. You know, because I'm a software developer, of course, I tried to go into video games to tell my story that way, I found out eventually that a good story is a part of a good game, but it's not what makes a game good. I found that the video game aspect was just getting in my way because at the end of the day, that's not what I really wanted to be doing. As a writer, as a longtime writer, I should say, when was the first time that you learned that language had power? Oh, that's, uh, that's an interesting one. First time I learned language had power... I was actually in university. I was in an English class and I was writing. The teacher told me that it was a waste of my time to be in there. At the time, I thought she was going the other direction with that. I thought that I was the screw up there. But no, uh, she was telling me that I should have been in a more advanced class. When I unraveled that, 
I realized that this was effectively the same as the meaning she intended, but because it was phrased in an ambiguous way, I decided to go somewhere else with it. It effectively actually shut me down from writing for a few months. One simple sentence can actually derail somebody in that way, even if you don't intend for them to do that, then yeah, that is a lot of power in one sentence. So when you finally got your footing, or even before that, before that particular sentence, what was the first thing that you wrote that you thought that, yes, I could do this as a career? I want to say that goes all the way back to when my age was in single digits. I wrote a pretty bog standard adventurers take down a dragon a short story it was roughly 200 words it wasn't wasn't exactly the hugest uh, manuscript there you know it was a lot more than people my age were writing i looked at it and i thought you know this is this is good i'm amazing you know i was a i was a very proud eight-year-old <laughs> this is great. I should just do this. My writing career didn't uh, take off immediately at that age. Uh, I'm sure you're shocked to learn that uh, publishers didn't pick up on my 200 word narrative. <laughs> you know, we had the, we had the next like uh, uh, Margaret Weiss and all this other stuff in, in front of us here and, and quite lit and, and Hickman and all that other stuff. And they didn't pick you up at age eight. I'm just, I'm disappointed in the industry. Damn it. Yeah, uh, how did how did they not know to come to my house and read my story? Jeez. But yeah, I have wanted to be a writer since I was pretty young. Uh, it just never worked out professionally for me because I never could find how I wanted to express this. Uh, of course, I tried with novels, and it didn't click the way I wanted it to, and I couldn't figure out why. I should have figured out why a lot sooner because I grew up reading comics. It just never occurred to me to write one. Well, then, as an avid reader that you are, what was your first literary pilgrimage that really just drew you into comics? When I was pretty young, my dad uh, passed a yard sale, and they were selling boxes of comics for a, a dollar each. And he loaded up the back of his pickup with one dollar boxes of comics it was mostly comics from the mid to late 70s a lot of spider-man a lot of x-men there was some dc in there there was there was a significant amount of wonder woman but not a whole lot of other dc it was mostly marvel spider-man really spoke to me because uh he was he was a huge nerd he made his costume with needle and thread that he took from his aunt and you know he made his uh made his web shooters just with the power of his brain he created a technological masterpiece really because i mean nobody could figure out how he made the webbing right but then he also had that weakness too a lot of villains caught on eventually and just started breaking the the web shooters, which uh, really hamstrung him. He was just a regular guy who happened to stumble upon superpowers. And I liked that a lot. He was no Superman. As a writer then, and with Mara specifically, you know, what themes did you put into this book that really spoke to you as a writer? I've always loved the wolf and girl trope. And I think that goes back to Princess Mononoke. I wasn't thinking of that in particular while I was writing the first chapter of Mara, but it's difficult to imagine that it came from somewhere else. Mara actually won out against a different wolf and girl comic that I was considering at the time. It was a much different theme. It was uh, more of a, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with White Wolf's Exalted. The Exalted are goblins effectively and so it's a it's a much higher power universe well everything is a lot more colorful and bright and higher stakes and i almost uh 
based my uh, my first comic on that world rather than the direction I went. The reason I went with Mara, I believe, was because I could more readily connect to the character of Mara than I could with the other character because Mara, like Peter Parker, was just an ordinary kid who had powers thrust upon her rather than someone who already was heroic. In going a little darker with this, what was the hardest scene for you to write then so far with Mara? Uh, the hardest scene for me to write so far uh, of what we've already seen was when she was burying her parents. Uh, that that was a difficult one because, you know, before that, she was scared, she was hiding, and then she got Amaruk's powers and just flew into a rage. And then the rage was over and she still had to deal with it. There's a later scene that is uh, that hasn't been drawn yet that was also very difficult to write where uh, she realizes she can't protect anyone else with her powers. She can only protect herself. And no matter how hard she tries, she can't stop other people from dying. So it sounds like a lot of grief, a lot of anguish, a lot of frustration going through uh, such a young character as well, too. Is suffering what makes good characters? I think a balance is what makes good characters because if all you do is kick your character over and over and over, the readers will eventually just get used to it and it won't matter anymore. You're torturing Mara again. No surprise, right? And it, it also goes the other way too. If your character always gets what they want, nobody will feel any tension because they'll just say, oh, well, it's going to work out by the next page, I'm sure. That's part of why in chapter two, I introduced the more colorful characters like Jum. Jum is one of my favorite characters to write. You know, he's a big goofy guy and he's not afraid of her at all. Do you believe in writer's block? I think writer's block happens more often when you try to push yourself to a particular schedule. One of the writers I grew up reading a lot was Stephen King. And one thing he says is every day, put out six pages, clean, edited, complete. It's hard to discount King's work, but I feel like a schedule like that will lead to writer's block because what if you're not feeling creative on a given day? Now you're trying to force yourself to write more pages because you have this artificial schedule to keep. When inspiration happens, you can get a lot more than six pages out. Does it? Does inspiration strike often for you? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, if I don't write down or type out a plot bunny bouncing around in my head, I'm not going to be able to sleep that night. Yeah, it, it bothers me until I get it out on paper. You know, there are there are drafts that I may or may not ever get to, of course. And uh, it's all because I'm just, I'm doing something completely unrelated and I'll fixate on a little detail and that little detail will blossom into an idea. And all of a sudden I have an idea that I need to deal with, right? Uh, I'm way ahead on Mars particular because i just let the the inspiration carry it you know uh, we're we're still drawing chapter two i've already finished writing chapter eight so then how many unfinished scripts do you have Ooh, let's see i've got a cyberpunk script i've got two modern day scripts i have a another fantasy script uh, i want yeah okay a superhero script. Yeah, uh, let's let's say there are five unfinished scripts that could reasonably turn into a comic. I, I always find naming characters interesting because it, it kind of dives into the psyche of of the creator themselves. How did you come up with the names of your characters for for Mara? Not only just Mara, but your other characters as well. So Mara, I leaned into some uh, Germanic 
names when it came to her and her tribe. Rain is also a, a Germanic name. I find that looking at other cultures for names also gives you more ideas beyond just the name, because then you look into the meaning of the name. Why is that significant? You know, how many other people have names like this? Are there famous people with this name? Are there infamous people with this name? So it just leads you down another rabbit hole. What I think the basis of creativity is, is having information in your subconscious. So the more you read, the more you watch, the more you play, the more you research, the more you'll be able to be creative later. And you may not always remember specifically, oh yeah, I got this idea from a Wikipedia article I read three years ago. But that Wikipedia article you read three years ago is still significant. Consume more. You'll be able to write more. So what did you edit out of this book so far? Oh, let's see. What have I edited out? There was another character in chapter two who woke up in the cave with the rest of the party that I remember because he is an orc and I wanted to portray orcs as being more rare. I decided later on to ax that character because there are very few orcs left in this world. Writing, how many characters do you currently have in the party? Five, six, something like that? Uh, besides Mara, we also have Pile, Kalmore, Jum, and Ben Kenki. You have a good good adventure party to go forth to uh, throughout your world. So that's that's amazing to see. And I, I love the, the different races and the different characters and everything like that. And, and the quick introduction that we, we received wasn't overdone. It was just simple to the point. Here's the people. Here's here's who can talk to who, et cetera, and away you go. And I, I love that fact that we're not bogged down by exposition and narration and history yet. Part of why I appreciate having child characters in fantasy in particular, the reader doesn't know a whole lot about them. So what excuse do you have for an adult character to be talking about well-known history in that world? Not much, unless they're explaining it to a child. I find that Amara being only eight has a lot to learn, and that gives me a chance to teach the reader about the world in a way that seems organic. This game is called Overrated, Underrated. You can say overrated, underrated, or perfectly rated, just if you don't think it's either or, okay. or if you think it's just amazing. Start off with an easy one, Final Fantasy. Uh, that's a little more difficult than I think you're uh, giving it credit. For. The current state of the series, overrated. Initially, also overrated. Around the middle, I want to say it was just about perfect. I think uh, Final Fantasy X had exactly the rating that it deserved, but that's the, uh, that's the middle of the curve for me. You're saying like one to six is overrated, seven to, to ten was perfect, and then eleven on was overrated? I feel like that's about captured it, yeah. Uh, six can maybe be uh, perfectly rated. Maybe. It started getting about where it should have been the closer we get to 10, and the further we get away from 10, the more overrated it gets, in my opinion. Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate is perfectly rated. Dark Souls. Dark Souls was perfectly rated. Loved it. Why? Yes, it was difficult, and that was the meme, right? It, it never felt like a gotcha. It felt like, well, okay, what did I do wrong and how can I improve next time? If you're paying attention and you're not, you're not tilting, then you are getting better each time. That's what appealed to me about Dark Souls is that no matter how difficult you felt something was, it wasn't a silly gimmick that you had to look up online. You absolutely could just get better at it by throwing yourself against the mob every time. Are you you must be you are you're a big RPG. -er. I feel like Mass Effect trilogy. Yeah. Shame they never made another one, you know? Oh they are. No, no, no. There's it's, it's only the three. Oh. <laughs> it's only the three. Uh, the Mass Effect trilogy is probably the best trilogy in gaming. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I will die on that hill. Okay, then. How about Witcher? Witcher. One and two, not worth playing. Three was perfectly rated. You know, the RPG by which I judge all others 
is Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is the metric by which I judge every other RPG. I still have the original PC game too. I I also have it in a box, you know. <laughs> At what point are we good enough? It's not something that I think we should judge ourselves because a lot of creators will never think that they are good enough. It's something that you have to show your work to others and have them say, this is good. At that point, you're good enough for something that I think more people are doing. I also paint miniatures, very common in our, uh, in our little circle. It is very easy to never think it's done. You pick something up and you paint it and you paint it and you paint it and you're just slopping more paint on it because you don't think you've done enough. But if you show it to somebody else, they're not going to see all the corners you cut. They're not going to see uh, the mistakes you've made. They're going to see a painted miniature and to them it's going to be better than you think it is. So when are you good enough? When someone else tells you you're good enough? Because I think a creator is a bad judge of their own work. When did your life change for the better? When did my life change for the better? I uh, met the woman I ended up marrying when I was in university. That was the best thing that happened to me. I'm not even the only person who says that. My friends at the time said in no uncertain terms that uh, Lisa is the best thing that ever happened to me. That's a good answer if she's listening by the door there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it is a common answer that many people say, but for the better too. You know, yeah. you wouldn't improve in yourself or your life if, if you didn't meet your significant other. What is one mistake you'll never do again? One mistake I'll never do again. When I was trying to get into video games, I had a buddy who was a 3D artist. We were operating off of a... Uh, yeah, we'll both work for free and then we'll split the profits. That doesn't end up working. Not in my experience. So what ended up happening was the game never got finished and I'm no longer friends with him. So I will never ask someone to work with the promise of splitting profits later. I would rather maintain uh, my friendship with someone and pay them for their time. And maybe I never make a dime off of it but it's less of a loss than the fallout. Then from a maybe more of a mentorship aspect or maybe during your career as in your industry and even as a writer yourself, what is the wisest thing that someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? The wisest thing I've ever heard, and it didn't. it's not going to sound wise until you break it down, so bear with me. Here. If a senior programmer starts swearing during your interview, you got the job. <laughs> in, in my industry, we swear a lot. When we're doing interviews, we try to put a cap on that. You know, keep it professional. Human resources is probably also there, you know, or your boss is there. And they just have you asking technical questions. When the veil drops, you probably got the job. Because they're putting on an act... And if they're, if someone's actually willing to open up and show who they really are, then you're probably going to go further with that person. Uh, it's always good to let loose once in a while, you know? Yeah. And, and you have to as a, as a programmer <laughs> or else you're just gonna, you're just gonna kill someone. And then HR really gets involved and then maybe the police or whatever. The paperwork is a pain in the ass. Oh yeah. The paperwork is awful. Ugh. Red tape is not fun. No. All right. I have my last four questions to ask as well, too, when it comes to the uh, introspective nature of this show and, of course, yourself as a creator. Before I do that, is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like to showcase with those that are watching and listening to this? One thing that uh, I wanted to talk about with this comic and my writing in particular is uh, I like to have a character that can be described as a joke if you strip away the world and the fact that it's played straight. In the case of Mara, the joke is, what if an eight-year-old girl was just the strongest person you've ever met? I think that characters built on that have a lot of room to grow. 
And I also think that there needs to be some humor in it. There needs to be some humor in it. It goes back to what we were talking about before. Where you can't just keep kicking the character all the time. You know, I think people in general need to have some humor in them. Uh, I don't think I would ever get along with someone who was uh, humorless. So why would I want to write about a character like that either? Everyone has one or two people that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Besides the other creators whose work I've read, when I was in high school, I was coming home and I was really sick. I just knocked on a random door. You know, I was I was making my way to uh, to the dock because we actually took a boat to uh, to school at that time. I was on my way to the dock and I knocked on some random person's door and begged him to use the bathroom. And he let me in and gave me some medicine for my stomach. He let me use the bathroom and, you know, and made sure I was okay. And I was like, man, you're, uh, you're being really nice to some random person knocking on your door. And he said, everyone is my brother and everyone is my sister. And that really stuck with me. You know, I don't know that I am as nice as that guy, but I know that I can try to be. <laughs> That's, that's someone who, uh, yeah, I, I was pretty young at the time, but I've never forgotten that encounter because for him, that was just a few minutes out of his day. But for me, that, uh, that really, that could have gone very differently for me if I hadn't met someone that nice. Other than that, um, there is, uh, there is one teacher that, um, I remember from university, he wasn't very nice. He made sure that we were prepared for our careers. The binder he made us put together, I still reference as a software developer today. The reason I remember him is not just that binder, but because I never got to thank him for that. He passed away several years ago from cancer. And when that happened, I realized that I had never apologized for my behavior in class because, like I said, he wasn't very nice and I wasn't very nice back. I thought his class was pretty useless and I was wrong. That made me realize that I shouldn't wait for things like this because the next person I need to thank might not be around for very much longer either. And I should do that while I still have the chance. Yeah, there was a comic artist recently that passed away that was in our circle when it came to uh, to creating comics and all that other stuff, and just a wonderful person, and and just passed away a few days ago suddenly. It was it was a shame, and um, you know, losing losing a person, losing a sense of humor that 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 person had specifically, at least in our circle, it was it was a shock, and you know, you, you have to to thank every day that you're, you're above ground, they say. From a professional standpoint, you have created a comic. You are in the video game industry. You are a comic writer and a writer that has done much work and conti will continue to do many amazing things in your future. And I'm loving Mara, and, and I know you're going to create some amazing works as well, too, and I'll definitely want to have you back on the show for that. So from a professional standpoint, you are successful. But do you consider yourself personally successful? You know, as creators, we have goals we want to achieve beyond simply creating the next thing. You know, what, what do you want to do with your career? Do you want to go full time into it? Do you want to work with someone specific? I think about that a lot. And I think success for me would be to be able to actually do this comic full time not just this comic, but comics in general, because we talked about it before. I have several unfinished scripts and by the end of next year, I'll have several more, right? I have a lot of ideas and I once heard a saying that goes, the richest place in the country is the graveyard because it's full of ideas. And I want to get as many of those ideas as I can out before I'm out of time who knows when I'll be out of time and who knows how many 
ideas I'll have before then. The rate at which I'm producing comics now, I feel is a bit too slow. I would love to be able to go faster. You know, that means going full time into it. Uh, I'm not at that place yet, but uh, I'm working on it. Best I can do is work on it more, right? The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? I like burning. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually a lightweight, so don't uh, don't worry about me abusing it too much. You know, a, a, a finger in is plenty. Um, Could be taken totally out of the context in many situations. I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but more seriously, um, yeah. how I deal with failure. Um, well. You know, you, you mope a little bit. You always mope a little bit, but um, then you realize that that's not going to get you back on your feet. You, you can mope around forever and not accomplish anything. What I do to pull myself out of that slump, expose myself to media that makes me happy. I've always been a fan of anime from uh, Howl's Moving Castle and that sort of thing to the, uh, the less bright and nice things like Akira. I, I even have a bit of love for the overrated stuff like Naruto. I get back into uh, movies and shows that make me happy. Rewatch Robocop for the umpteenth time. I uh, lost track how many times I watched that as a child on VHS. For me, anyway, I can't speak for anyone else. When I'm watching these things that I enjoy, when I'm playing these games I enjoy, I'll remember why I enjoyed them in the first place and how they inspired me. And that will give me what I need to uh, get back on my feet and be creative again. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And in fact, you have the younger generation that is with you currently, and they may be inspired to be creative with whatever they'd like to be creative in. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? The best way to inspire someone else is to just be honest with your own creativity. You see a lot of movies will uh, be produced in a very formulaic way because that's what works. And from a business standpoint, it's hard to fault that. But nobody's going to be inspired by something that seems factory produced. Produce something that means something to you. If you can get eyes in front of it, someone will be inspired by it. Well, you survived the introspective questions of Two Geeks Talking, so congratulations on that. But before I let you go, how can we support you? Where can we find you on social media and schedule something for, for next year? I'd love to have you back on. I'd love to be back on. We are primarily funded by Patreon. Uh, you can find us at uh, patreon.com slash stuffed rock. That'll also get you early access to the comic. Uh, we have we have a few tiers. You know, we have early access uh, as the, at the lowest tier, which also gets you into the Discord. You can chat to me and Rosie, and of course the uh, the translators are there as well. You go up and you get the high quality ones because. It is uploaded on the web. I can't put the top quality on the web page. It would take too long to load. These pages are 15 megabytes a piece at the, at the top quality. I don't, that's not going on a web page. No. You have the top tier that gets the work in progress and the lore posts as well. All of that helps keeps us, keep us going. You can find us on Facebook at Facebook uh, slash Stuff Rock Studio. Twitter, we're under Stuff Rock. You can see the free... Uh, the free pages we've uploaded on mara-comic.com. Those that are watching and listening to this, go support Dylan and go support his amazing comic as well too. Support his Patreon and, and help him out any way that you can or else, you know, this comic is going to go by the wayside. So support him. <laughs> it's that easy. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, like I said, that ends a particular episode of Two Geese Talking. I want to say you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website, TGT Media or twogeekstalking.com as well as our YouTube channel youtube.com forward slash c forward slash TGT media and as I say every week everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking <laughs>